So you want to become adept at the stealth mechanics in Breath of the Wild, or maybe just have a better understanding of it, and that's awesome. It's a very detailed system, and understanding its aspects such as enemy detection, the stealth suit, and everything about it will give to mastery at sneaking around all enemies and their bases, which is especially helpful to be able to pull off the fabled stealth strike, a move that grants 8 times the normal damage of a hit on top of whatever attack buffs you already have. This move is an absolute game changer, but it's common that a lot of attempts for this could fail due to a lack of understanding of how the stealth mechanics work. Which isn't always your fault, because stealth mechanics between many different games can vary greatly, and carry their own rules. So with that, I took it to myself to research everything I could about Zelda's stealth system, ranging from all the different ways an enemy can detect the player, to how outside factors such as time of day, or how crouching and tall grass can affect this detection, and even understanding the stealth buffs themselves to explain to you all how the system works, using detailed stats and data when I can. So hopefully by the end, you'll become the fiercest shadow in Hyrule. So without further delay, let's get right into it. Before directly explaining how player stealth mechanics work, we first need to explain and understand the details on a mechanic called enemy detection. As many of you may know, whenever an enemy has an explanation point above their head, it means that they have detected you and are going to pursue, while a question mark means that they are suspicious and are meaning to investigate to some fashion, which then may lead to the explanation point. Now, there are two main ways an enemy can enter one of these states relating to their senses, an enemy's vision and an enemy's hearing which we'll go over how each one works one by one, starting with the vision. So many monsters in this game, like the Spacoblin, will clearly use their eyes to see the player if they're in range, which will put them in either a suspicious question mode or a pursuit explanation point mode, depending on where the player is. This is determined by the two separate cones of vision that a Bacoblin has, one long 40 degree cone, which will trigger their suspicious mode when the player is inside, and one shorter 90 degree cone, which will instantly alert the enemy of the player's presence when inside. The lengths of these cones are measured by its own unique style of measurements that we'll just call units, with the long one being 40 and the short being 30, as explained in the game files, but these will be comparative to the other measurements throughout this video. So quite clearly, if a player enters a Bacoblin's inner cone, they will detect and pursue the player until either they run out of the Bacoblin's spawn zone, or if the player manages to hide somewhere nearby that the Bacoblin can't reach you by walking. However, if the player just enters the enemy's outer cone, the enemy will enter its suspicious state, and the player is given a few seconds to leave before the enemy fully detects the player and begins to pursue, so think of it as a warning zone. The time leading to detection in this cone is indicated by the red question mark filling up the longer the player is there, which just takes 6 seconds to fill up on normal mode, or 3 seconds on master mode to match the mode's harder difficulty. However, stepping even a step outside the cone will instantly remove their suspicion and bring them back to neutrality. You can even keep stepping inside and outside of their outer cone to rapidly trigger that, and you'll see where the exact boundary is. He's not very bright to not investigate. Now, the only other question to add on top of this is how other environmental and surrounding factors can alter an enemy's sight. Well, for one, if there is an obstacle obstructing the enemy's sight, even in their cone of vision, then they simply cannot see you. Pretty common eye knowledge. A player can also hide in tall grass to hide themselves inside an enemy's cone of vision, but it's actually very touchy as it only obstructs your vision in the tallest of grass, as even a touch into anything shorter will trigger their alert. Yeah, even that. Plus, you need to make sure that you're only stealthing while doing so, as literally any other movement type like doing the crouch jump or even drawing your bow will raise the player high enough to trigger the enemy alerts most times. Next, hiding in the shadows or waiting for the sun to go down doesn't seem to affect an enemy's sight, which is presumably because they have some sort of night vision anyways, but the time of day is still important for stealth as most camp monsters go to sleep at night, meaning that their vision is completely shut off, and only their ears are open. But be careful when going in for the sneak strike though, as if an enemy is bumped into while trying to pull one off, this will also trigger their detection, so keep a safe distance. And lastly, but not least, the player's stealth buff, via either potion or armor, has no effect on the enemy's sight detection, as that is strictly for the sound, which we'll get into in just a sec. Because first, we need to cover the last important thing about vision cones, which is how they differ between all the world's monsters. The one that we show for the Bacoblin, as pictured here with the two angles and sizes, happens to be shared between almost all other Bokos, Lizzles, and Moblins in the world, with the only small difference being the vertical up and down distance of the cones, which is pretty self-explanatory to their height, and not pictured here. The only types of these enemies that vary in eyesight stats are found mostly within the Archer Tower and Lookout variants, 
like the Bokoblin Watchtowers for an example, feature the same angle measurements as the standard, but with a slightly longer suspicious cone and a slightly shorter detected cone, which prevents a player from running straight into their detected zone head-on with a longer warning length. The archers on the master mode floating platforms had the same standard detection cone, but their suspicious cone is twice as long as usual, with a slightly wider 60 degrees wide angle. Yeah, a lot of these archers will vary a lot like this depending on the type of enemy and position. But showing them all off here will take a while, so I'll have all these exact values of each listed in the description. But okay, a couple more unique enemies to show off because they're pretty interesting. The Wizrobes are one of the few enemies that don't even have their outer suspicious cone, and rather, they just have a 30 unit long detection circle around them that will trigger their alert. I guess that's just the work of whatever magic they're using. Other enemies also use a similar system of only having a detection cone and not a suspicious one, such as the Guardians, which can see out 100 units and up to 60 degrees, which makes for a pretty long range scout. And even the Archer Lizzles, specifically in the Goron Mines area, have an 80 unit long, 90 degree angle alert cone, so a lot of these are really meant to be specifically adjusted to their environments. And last but not least, the Muldugas are totally different in the way that they can't even sense you with their eyes at all and have zero vision cones, so instead they can only detect you with their hearing, which will be the other major end to stealth that we will discuss. So, the most important thing to understand about sound when it comes to stealth is that it's never actually enough to trigger an enemy's alert by itself, but rather, a noise makes an enemy pursue its source so the player hopefully ends up in their cone of vision. Hearing something suspicious will cause an enemy to pop their question mark, but unlike the question mark gained from their outer vision cone, one cause from hearing will cause an enemy to actually walk towards where that sound came from to hopefully see the source of it. The amount of sound a player makes in game is, I guess, technically indicated by this purple sound meter found on the base HUD, but I honestly never found this helpful in the slightest, as it really doesn't tell you anything that you don't know or can't hear already. And these wavy lines are just so vague too, so let's ignore it. Obviously, very minor sounds won't be enough to trigger an enemy's suspicion, as there is a hearing threshold that determines this, both dependent on the loudness of the action and the distance away from it. But what sounds are actually safe enough to still be able to get close to a monster without alerting them? And how does player movements affect this when trying to get close to perform a stealth strike? Well, unfortunately, there are no exact stats we'll have to work with on the decibel levels of each of a player's actions. So we'll just have to look at all the different sounds comparatively between all of Link's moves. At its base, there are three different ways a player can be quiet enough to approach an enemy closely to perform a sneak strike. 1. Walking very, very slowly by barely tilting the analog stick. 2. Stealthing at half speed, as even full speed in this mode will alert the enemy at the very end. And 3. Dropping right next to an enemy via paragliding or falling, which ironically are all safe, quiet enough actions to not cross over the enemy's hearing threshold to trigger an alert of any kind. But more than likely at this point, you already have access to the stealth sets or stealth buffs, which helps stretch the player movement limits to safely perform louder actions closer to a target as each tier of stealth buff reduces your sound outputs by a set percentage. A level 1 buff makes a player 20% quieter, a level 2 makes them 40% quieter, and a level 3 buff makes a player a whole 70% quieter. So what this means, an example to this, is that with a level 1 buff, a player can now safely stealth at full speed around an enemy while avoiding detection, and even use a stealth jump to get around faster. A level 2 buff allows a full speed walk to not trigger an alert until they are very close, and the powerful level 3 buff makes it so full speed walking and even hopping around doesn't trigger an alert whatsoever, so you don't even need to use the crouch move or slow down to get close at all. Now this is a tier of buff that should be strived for to pull off the stealthiest yet speedy attacks, but it's important to note that there are still many actions with this that will still make you too noisy. Like sprinting is still a very loud action with a buff or without, and should be avoided at all costs when stealthing. And actions such as whistling or doing any form of melee attack besides stealth strikes do not get reduced by the percentage buff at all actually, so these are all definite no's. On another note, there is one big misconception when it comes to a player's noise outputs on the subject of equipped armor and weapons, as since they make a clanking sound whenever walking around, most players think that taking them off while stealthing will make them quieter, which I don't blame them one bit, but this actually doesn't have any effect at all on a player's actual noise output from a mechanical standpoint, so there is no need. But it is a cool detail to point out that having a stealth buff makes this clinking way quieter anyways, so neat touch. The only actual exterior factor that I found that reduces the player noise outside the stealth buff is the rain, which actually grants something equivalent to a stackable level 1 stealth buff while downpouring, making stealth easier at a point where you don't always have access to the full sets or buffs. 
But with all this info on the stealth mechanics in mind, how can the knowledge we discussed today be used to sneakily chop your way through this game as efficiently as possible? Well, for one, it's important to know that when an enemy is stealth-stricken, a player can chain this into another powerful stealth strike by doing a complete 180 around the enemy before they get up. Which is possible because the enemy always gets up to face the way they are hit from, so you're effectively staying within their blind spot. Doing this over and over is called Stealth Strike Chaining, an insanely overpowered move that is fantastic and efficient for taking down single enemies. However, if you need help with getting through many enemies at once in camps, make sure to distract them first by using sound to your advantage. You can shoot an arrow or throw a bomb to get them all facing the same way and out of your line of sight, as they will be able to hear these things from about 20-ish units away. Some lower tier enemies can also be baited using different types of meats or fish, which is a much more prominent, longer lasting distraction, as enemies are far less perceptible to the surroundings while mid chow. It can also allow for some easy free hits as long as you have the materials to spare. But in case you do get caught for any reason, it's best to run up onto a platform where an enemy can't reach you as you'll usually soon just give up and run back. Perfect for resetting any situation back to its base after some successful or even unsuccessful stealth strikes. Just make sure to try not to escape pursuing enemies by climbing on a wall or tree and waiting for them to leave. Because more than likely, they'll just keep throwing those rocks at you for all eternity, until you're standing on some actual solid ground or really high up from them. All these tips are very helpful for making the best out of the stealth in this game, and we have used quite a few of these when we played a very stealth-focused run of Breath of the Wild, beating the game using only Sheikah gear, a very fun challenge run that I recommend checking out when possible. But with this said, I want to thank you all so much for watching this episode of Stats of the Wild. It's been a while since we made the last one, and that's basically because we've already covered mostly everything I've wanted to over the total 16 episodes in this series. From here, it's possible we'll cover some minor stuff here and there, but I'm mostly going to be saving my energy and dedication to the sequel of Breath of the Wild when that comes out, which will be a whole new series in itself. It's going to be super interesting to see how that all goes. But thanks again so much for watching the video though. If this was helpful in any way, please feel free to leave a like and sub if you haven't already for more Breath of the Wild on the channel, and I'll see you guys all in the next one. Goodbye!